Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, well, uh, welcome to everybody who is here physically, um, here in the, in, in the New Bailey um, building, number two New Bailey. Oh. It's great to be seeing everybody physically at long last. Uh, we've no doubt got a much bigger audience online. Um, so um, we'll see how this goes. Um, I'll just introduce myself. My name's Phil Doyle um, from Five Plus Architects. I'm the chair of the BCO Northern Region. So delighted to introduce um, the event um, this afternoon. Um, just a, a few um, points of admin to um, start off with. This is one of the great beauties of being back at physical events. We can now talk about fire alarms. I'm sure everybody's missed fire alarms uh, in the last 18 months. So there is no planned fire alarm. For those that are here physically, um, if the fire alarm does go, then it's back the way that you came, down the staircase rather than the lift. And I believe the muster point is out in the pocket space between here and number one, uh, New Bailey. Um, so we're, we're here um, and talking about um, part of the, the BCO e ESG um, Zero Carbon series. We've got the third in a five series events here. That all culminates in November uh, with an event in Glasgow, which coincides with the UN um, COP26 um, conference. Um, the first two events, um, um, we started off with the definition of net zero, then the value of net zero, and we're talking about zero carbon in operation. And no better place, I think, than, than here at New Bailey, where I think we've seen a real transition in the buildings over the last, um, probably let's talk about 10 years, I think, in terms of design and getting things off the ground as to where we are now, and perhaps looking forward to the next 10 years. I'm preempting what might uh, come next, but what a great place, uh, I think, to be, and a great place to be back um, in terms of physical uh, events. Um, so, um, I think just also to thank all of, all of the sponsors, um, Kundal, Make, um, English Cities Fund and SAS, and of course the BCO for hosting. Uh, I think we're all delighted with what the BCO has done over the last 18 months, keeping events um, going. Take a look on the website, take a look at the newsletters, loads of further stuff um, coming. In the north, specifically, we're looking for some uh, more physical events, and those will get posted through the newsletter and on the website shortly, but we're looking for some really good events in, in September, which are already in the offing. So I'd just like to introduce the speakers. We've got three great speakers um, uh, this afternoon. Um, first of all, um, first up will be Phil Marsden uh, from ECF. Uh, Phil has managed the development at New Bailey. He's currently also working on the, Cre the Salford Crescent uh, Master Plan and he's also heading up uh, Muse's approach to environmental and social governance. We've then also got Stuart Fraser. Stuart's a partner at Make Architects. Um, joined Make in 2004 and has worked on a series of projects from master plans to one-off houses, hotels, and resorts to Olympic arenas. That's quite good timing. He's also done a few offices as well, including uh, three new Bailey, which is the new GPU uh, Bailey, uh, building here, four new ba Bailey, which is the BT uh, building, and plot A3. He's also involved in the Salford Crescent master plan and is leading the master plan there. We've then also got Simon Wyatt. Um, I'm sure a lot of people know Simon. Um, Simon leads Kundal's net zero carbon and sustainable governance teams. He's an environmental specialist focusing on carbon reduction policy and strategy. He's also authored official policy on embodied and whole life carbon in the UK and internationally, and he's also a member of the UK Green Building Council's Members Advisory Committee, and of course um, involved heavily with the British Council for Offices, Environment, Social and Governance Group. The Whole Life Carbon Network, WLN, WLCN Committee, the Green Property Alliance and is chair of the SIBSI Knowledge Generation Panel. So I think um, Simon's definitely the tech geeky guy in all of this. So uh, without further ado, uh, that's enough from me. Uh, final welcome on behalf of the BCO in the north, and I'll just hand over to Phil Marsden now to start the proper part of the um, proceedings. Thank you. I think Simon was just showing off with that introduction, wasn't he? But, uh, so um, welcome to, uh, to New Bailey, and uh, more specifically to New Bailey. Um, we completed this building in October last year in the middle of the pandemic, which I don't think there's anyone from B&K here, so I can sort of pay them a compliment in their fantastic work. If Bowman currently built this building for us, and 
amazing achievement to uh, to get this building completed in, in the middle of COVID. And it's great to see um, people inside the building, real people. Um, BLM and Eversheds uh, are shortly uh, due to move in, so it's going to be you know it's going to be great. We welcome them to the uh, to the new Bailey Estate. Um, I'm just going to give a very quick overview of the master plan here at New Bailey uh, before Stuart and Simon talk through um, some of the very exciting work we're doing on the next office phase at, um, at Plot A3 and that's where we're going to focus um, today's presentation. Um, on the screen now is the, uh, is the master plan, um, probably more so for those on the live link. Uh, New Bailey sits right on the boundary between Manchester and Salford, the, the River Hill is actually the boundary but is very proudly within Salford. Um, New Bailey forms part of our wider Salford Central development, um, a huge development that we've been working on for the last 15, uh, 15 years or so. Um, the yellow buildings, I think they look yellow, they don't look yellow from here, but the yellow buildings on the plan uh, effectively form the New Bailey estate. Um, now you can see, um, I'll just quickly run through the sequence of how we've delivered the buildings. Um, the multi-storey car park came first, and there's, there's a good reason for that, and you'll see on the next slide why we built that building first. Um, one New Bailey came next, followed by two New Bailey where we are now. Um, plot one, which is home to, uh, to the government, um, completed last year. Um, plot B7 we're currently on site at the moment with. Um, you might, Riverside House, I shouldn't forget, actually fell just after, uh, after two New Bailey, which is, uh, which is where news are based, actually. Um, you might have seen in the press that LNG have just put planning in for uh, a new development on the Rally Keys site, uh, which is a new office and a hotel, so that'll be a another great addition to the estate. Um, we've got some really exciting uh, proposals for the arches, which sit at the back of the, um, the multi-storey car park. Fantastic space there that we can use for, uh, for leisure and workspace use. And we're also in discussions with the, um, with the leaseholder on the Mark Addy um, to look to do something, uh, to look to do some leisure use at ground floor there on that site. So um, once all that's done, the estate's pretty much complete. Uh, as you can see, Plot A3 sits on the other side of Irwell Street, but is very much part of the uh, part of the New Bailey Estate. Uh, if you wind the clock back ten years uh, or so, I think this picture was probably taken about ten years ago. That's what New Bailey looked like, um, and you can see why we built the multi-storey car park first. <laughs> um, effectively, this site was a car park for people commuting into Manchester, along with the other side of Irwell Street, where uh, predominantly residential development's taken place. Um, so I just think I love looking at that picture and thinking how transformational um, it is in terms of going from there to where we are now in pretty much seven years. Um, so I think it's amazing, an amazing shot. And you can actually see spinning fields under construction now as well. Um, New Bailey's got quite an interesting history. Um, in the late 1700s, this was home to the New Bailey prison. Um, it's, the prison was the first of its type actually in its sort of cruciform design and it's a it's a sort of prototype design that's been rolled out across across the world. So it's quite an important sort of site in terms of its historical relevance. Um, in the mid 1800s, the prison was demolished and was moved um, to strange ways. Um, we've had to effectively, before any development could take place in any plot here, we've had to uncover the footings from the prison and record those. Um, they did such a good job of clearing the prison when they demolished it that we've not found literally nothing other than those footings you can see in foundations we didn't find one piece of artifact uh, but you can see the cells from the prison there on the on the image um which you could just about stand up in you couldn't actually lie down in those so it must have been a, a pretty uh, interesting environment for the uh, for the prisoners in the in the day um but we move on and um the first building uh we developed and um, which completed in the summer of 2016 was one new bailey a speculative office building um, but um, was largely pre-elected to Freshfields, which was an absolute, hugely significant moment for, uh, for New Bailey and acted as a catalyst really for, um, for future development um, and actually facilitated the, uh, the progress of 2 New Bailey, which is where we are today. Uh, this is an AHMM design building, um, another speculative office scheme, uh, but we've now got floors let to, uh, to Eversheds and BLM. Like I say, we've just completed the fit out and are due to move in in a month or so, uh, I think there's three and a half floors left in here. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, getting, we're getting close to being pre-let. Pre I think it's quite, picking up on Phil's point before, it's quite interesting to note the, 
design changes between one New Bailey and two New Bailey and how that office design has evolved. Um, you know, examples, there's less glazing, uh, improving the facade uh, performance. We've got a much bigger roof terrace. Cycling provision has, has increased significantly. A different choice of materials, you know, reducing carbon, embodied carbon levels. Um, I mean, one New Bailey has ceilings in, there's no ceilings in this building. I mean, all pretty obvious sort of things now in terms of office design. But actually what Stuart and Simon are going to talk you through is how that's evolved further in our thinking um, on plot A3. And I, I think the three speculative office buildings at New Bailey, one New Bailey, two New Bailey, and then A3, show a real sort of shift in office design over the last seven or eight years uh, with a massive focus now, as you'll see on plot A3, on the, um, on the environmental uh, performance uh, of buildings. Um, three New Bailey, another a hugely significant moment for uh, for New Bailey when we got a fully pre-let building to the government under their GPA program. Uh, so this was a make building. Stuart obviously heavily involved. Absolutely beautiful building in my biased opinion, but um, a great addition to the estate and, like I say, a massive a massive landmark moment for New Bailey when you go back to that image that I showed you when this was a surface car park seven or eight years ago. Um, BT have taken a pre-let on for New Bailey. We're currently in the um, just the calls going up on that building. We'll have a look when we when we walk around later. Um, again, a, a massive moment to pre-let uh, 180,000 square feet to uh, to someone like BT, and it's good to see a few faces uh, here today who've been involved in that, in that particular project. Um, that's a sort of a visual of the completed master plan, and you can see in the foreground there, uh, plot A3 uh, with the green facade. Um, which we'll, we're going to talk through in a lot more detail. Um, quite interesting timing in terms of the delivery and design of Play 3. A year or so back, um, News started its journey of creating our own sustainable development strategy, um, something I've been working on for the last 12 months. Um, and we're just about finished that strategy now. Simon's been heavily involved with that. <coughs> um, strategy which focuses on five key objectives, which are on, on the screen. And we've set some really stringent um, requirements under a number of KPIs under each objective. So, for example, under net zero carbon, we've got specific KPIs now for all our developments to achieve around upfront embodied carbon and operational energy. And the, re the requirement is very much focused as a delivery strategy. So this isn't a sort of woolly set of policy documents. This will change the way we design and construct our buildings moving forward. Um, and starting to produce that strategy coincided with us starting the design of plot A3, which is the next and last office phase actually at New Bailey. Um, and so we decided to use A3 as a pilot effectively for that strategy. Um, it was the right thing to do anyway, um, but we had a very, very clear vision for plot A3 that we've not moved from, and that was to be the most sustainable carbon efficient building we can develop. So clearly it's got to be viable, it's got to be lettable, it's got to work but sustain the sustainable performance, energy performance, carbon efficiency of that building was absolute top priority. Uh, we wanted a forward thinking approach um, to establish future office trends. We want to differentiate the office Oops. Um, to maximize its value, uh, innovative in terms of materials, spec, construction methods to reduce embodied carbon. But we weren't just focusing on carbon and energy performance, we wanted to look at the wider holistic impact on climate. So looking at occupancy, health, well-being and creating a significant net gain in biodiversity, which you'll see, well, there's a sort of a hint there as to how we've done that on the building, which, uh, which Stuart, will, Stuart will pick up on. So that was our vision for A3. I'm gonna hand over to Stuart now, who's gonna sort of take you through the building in a bit more detail and uh, hope you enjoy what Stuart and Simon have got to, uh, got to talk about. Thanks, Phil. Um, so plot A3, um, so just to give you a bit of background first of all before we go into some of the sort of technical uh, sides of things on it. I think you know, when we first started looking at this, there were a number of challenges with the site. So this, this drawing here is a sort of site plan sort of zoomed out. Um, Irwell Street is to the right hand side of, of, of the building shown in blue. Uh, and then to the left hand side, we've got what some of you can see out the window here, which is the multi-story car park uh, that sits on the site. And really, the master plan itself over years had changed it, had evolved. And the plot here, actually, at the time when we first started looking at it, actually had a contemporary uh, tall residential tower on it. And through various conversations, various opportunities, I think there was a strong desire to start looking back at office use in here. They were seen as it being more compatible to feed and build on the successes of New Bailey Master Plan, the other side of Irwell Street. 
But the challenge we had was it was quite a tight and compact site. You know, the tower that had been residential was much, much smaller footprint. The way the car park had evolved, as master vans do, they change, they evolve, things move around. Um, and we needed to somehow try and actually make sure we could get enough area on here to make it um, viable. And the big key move of all the options we looked at was going down the side core route. And the reason for this is because of the car park to one side, we were limited to 12 metres due to fire regulations which was actually causing us a problem. We couldn't get enough area in it. But actually, by being able to slide the core out of the building and actually into the gap between the car park and the actual main floor plate, we were able to get the core much, much closer, get more habitable area into that uh, typical floor plate. And the core, due to the fact that it's predominantly structure, the geology of it's solid, means that actually we're not constrained by the 12 metres. And that really was a sort of the unlocking moment that suddenly saw this project and the viability of it suddenly happen and start moving forwards. When we get to the ground floor, Irwell Street, and it's sort of the connectivity with the wider master plan was a key thing. Trying to make sure that we've got entrances located off of Irwell Street shown in the green where you've got visual connection from the other side of the road. We've got additional retail that comes in here shown in the pink that brings sort of activity and animation onto Irwell Street itself. We've additionally got support spaces in bike, bike parking, full sort of changing and support facilities that go with it at ground floor, easily accessible direct from the outside. But one of the key things equally on this was the fact that we were trying to avoid building a basement. So what that means that into the back of the, uh, of the building here, we've tried to squeeze in and efficiently as we can try and get all of the plant into the back of that space. So as we enter in, we get a double height space. Um, as you come through from Irwell Street, trying to keep this space uh, open, sort of informal, um, where the retail is further on, the idea of actually having connection to that retail space. So the idea that actually the lobby and the retail space work as one, it becomes a flexible space. Seating, benching, the idea that actually this can be somewhere where actually you turn up possibly early, somewhere to sit, somewhere to work, somewhere to co-work. And actually with the sort of television screen revealing statistics of how the building's performing, events, you'd probably have the Olympics on at the moment, means that actually we get a heart, get a place here for uh, everybody that becomes the sort of focus the, of, of, of the building, for everybody that's in it. Um, as you sort of move in and you move through, we've, we've looked at lots of the materials, looking at sort of recycled contents, we're looking at recycled uh, gym flooring to go down within all of the, um, the sort of common areas that run through. And then looking at sort of trying to keep the materials within here pretty raw, pretty loose, exposing concrete where we can, use of sort of lightweight meshes, exposing ceilings where we can. We've got a wellness suite at mezzanine level where we basically could visually connect that into the, uh, into the lobby space as well. On the typical plan, um, four number lifts, but one of the key moves is about how we introduce the stair into it. And actually, when you're stood in the lift lobby, making sure that we've got an everyday stair that connects into it, something that's clearly visible, trying to encourage uh, people to be using that stair. We're designed to an occupancy up to one in eight. Uh, if we can do multiple tenancy splits, 50-50. But also designed to take f alternative splits at 60-40, 70-30 as well, to add more flexibility within this, which when we add it up over the 11 storeys, gets us just over 110,000 square foot of net. So in terms of common spaces, the idea of keeping it simple, keeping it raw, the idea of this recycled timber runs through everywhere. We keep the concrete exposed, lightweight on the, on, on the ceilings where we need to be, and then overlaying with graphics and super graphics to add identity and branding through it. If you're stood in the core looking back towards the staircase, the idea that it's open, the fact you can see the stair. We're using a recycled red uh, rubber flooring within there. We've got windows in it bring a natural light in, trying to encourage that interconnection. Why use the lift? Try and get people to get into that stair. And then equally at level 12, whilst on the roof we've got lots of plant because we haven't got a basement, what we've still managed to do is actually work really, really hard to actually enable us to get a south-facing uh, terrace space for the tenants where we've got circa 2,000 square foot of this common area for everyone to uh, use and enjoy. So over to Simon. Thanks for the great overview. Um, so one of the key aspirations for the project was around net zero carbon. Uh, and we broke that into two requirements, which was net zero carbon on construction, looking at the embodied carbon. But the, the main focus was uh, looking at operational energy uh, in line with the new neighbor scheme, which was just emerging as we started to do the design of the development. I'm just gonna give a quick overview of what we mean by net zero carbon and the definitions, just so they're all on the same page. There's been a lot of uh, 
evolution over the last year. We started uh, designing this just as the UK GBC launched their net zero carbon definition and the Letty guidance hadn't actually been produced. So we were very much at the forefront of net zero carbon design. And there's been quite a lot of development over the last year in terms of the, the definitions and consistency projects. So the main uh, documentation for net zero carbon in the UK is obviously from the UK Green Building Council as part of the global uh, World Green Building Council's Advancing Net Zero Carbon Programme, which is aspiring for all buildings to be net zero carbon by 2030 for new buildings and existing buildings by 2050. Uh, they've set a comprehensive framework which looks at construction impacts and operation energy. Uh, when it was released, there wasn't a lot of detail uh, around this, and that's kind of been added by a number of groups, including the Whole Life Carbon Network and Letty. Uh, which have really set a, a precedence and a focus on intensity targets. So achieving embodied carbon targets uh, before offsetting and achieving operational standards before moving to renewable energy sources. Uh, again, the focus today will be on operational energy, but I'll just get, touch on, uh, on construction. So as Phil indicated, MUSE now have standards for all their projects to achieve upfront embodied carbon targets whilst considering whole life carbon. And um, the entire industry is really focusing on that upfront carbon because the climate emergency is now and we have to look to reduce uh, carbon emissions now. So most of the targets that are being set are for uh, cradle to site, including site activities, uh, whilst also considering the in-use phases uh, in operation and the demolition of the building at the end of site. In terms of A3, uh, we did an extensive uh, review uh, of the embodied carbon Removing the basement was one of the first things we did, uh, looking to significantly reduce the embodied carbon associated with a lot of concrete uh, with pouring the basements. We went through about 17 to 18 structural options, looking at the embodied carbon, uh, including uh, full timber solutions. Unfortunately, with the, the speculative nature of the development in the insurance uh, world as, as it is at the moment, we decided that timber, full timber was a step too far. Uh, we continue to look at timber cassettes and using timber flooring, and we were getting solutions down at kind of uh, just over 600, uh, but we ended up going from a slightly more traditional uh, scheme, but with high levels of cement replacement and recycled steel. Uh, we're in discussions with the contractor at the moment, and we're hoping to be around around about the 700 mark when we finally go to uh, site, and we'll be reporting that on practical completion, which is still probably about 30% lower than industry standard at the moment. Uh, in terms of the design, we use what we call seven, Kundal seven steps to net zero carbon. So that is looking at passive design first, making sure we get the fabric right, because all of the buildings on, a th uh, on New Bailey will have to be net zero carbon by 2050, uh, even the ones that were built uh, historically, so they will have to do retrofit works, and obviously people don't want to do retrofit works to the facade. It's much easier to look at uh, the services and equipment in the building. Once we've got the fabric right, it's about looking to reduce energy consumption and efficient systems. Uh, obviously, removing fossil fuels where possible because you can't, it's not credible to claim to be net zero carbon while still uh, burning fossil fuels on site. Providing renewable energy sources and then looking at whole life and upfront embodied carbon. So the definition for operational net zero carbon has been defined over the last year. And last month, Letty and the Whole Life Carbon Network in association with ROBA put out this new definition, which really is fairly clear on what a net zero carbon in operation building is. And it's one that minimizes uh, energy consumption in the first place and meets intensity targets. And that's gonna be really important going forward is these intensity targets and hitting kilowatt hours per meter squared before you're allowed to provide the energy from renewable sources. It's not okay just to build a building and offset or buy green energy. We must hit a energy performance standard. And that's in, that is basically uh, to enable the entire UK to transition to a net zero carbon economy. At the moment, we generate about 30% of our energy from renewables. And by 2050, we need to be producing all of our energy from renewables. The UK government are planning to double the amount of renewable generation we have with major offshore wind farms. But at the same time, we need significant reductions in the demand on the grid. And if you take it evenly across all sectors, it equates to roughly a 60% reduction uh, it, across all sectors. So if you want to uh, Paris align a building or, or a, a sector, you basically take 60% off where it is now, and that's where we need to get down to before we start looking to provide uh, renewable energy solutions. 
Uh, at the same time as looking at where we need to be, uh, there was a study done by Letty which looked at where office buildings could actually get to. And my colleague actually looked at this, modelled what is good practice at the moment, which is around about 160 kilowatt hours per metre squared, and then modelled a number of interventions demonstrated we can get down to kind of that 60%. And there's a magic number which a lot of people will talk about in terms of the RIBA, Letty, UKGBC of 55 kilowatt hours per metre squared. Uh, being the target for commercial offices, which is exceptionally challenging. And there are no buildings uh, designed speculatively at that level at the moment in the UK. Uh, you can see here the, the scale of the challenge. So 50% of the office stock in the UK at the moment is actually closer to 300 kilowatt hours per meter squared. Uh, the best kind of 25% are below 200. So it's a significant challenge. It's not a case of fine tuning and tweaking things. We need a significant step change on how we design buildings and one of the key ways we're doing that is focusing on that fabric first, using the passive house kind of standards to drive efficiencies. Uh, the UK GBC has re released a document specifically uh, at targeted at the commercial office sector, which sets out stepped targets and trajectories. So uh, moving down to that 55 uh, for the whole building, as you can see there in red, there's the targets for the whole building. But what uh, the UK GBC has done, which is really useful, is broken the targets down by base building, so the landlord systems, uh, and the tenanted areas, so looking at the lighting and small power associated with the tenants. Uh, and that has been used to form the UK Neighbours Scheme. So this is a scheme which uh, basically will judge uh, the office performance of the landlord systems uh, against the star rating. It's been used in Australia for over 10 years and was introduced into the UK uh, as of October last year. Uh, and all the uh, pioneering developers are supporting this and are starting to look at what ratings they can get for their new buildings. The UK GBC has aligned to this and uh, set a step trajectory to get to six stars, which is the best kind of performance you can achieve. Uh, most of the pioneering projects that are being done at the moment are aiming for five star. And uh, when we started New Bailey, the three New Bailey, uh, we were aiming for six stars, which was hugely ambitious. And we're not hitting six stars, but we do have pathways and strategies how we can potentially move down to it. I think we're about five and a half star now. And we'll go through some of the detail of that in a moment. So, as I said, the most important uh, element of uh, our net zero carbon strategy always starts with a fabric first approach, and I'll hand back to Stuart to go through the design. Thank you. Uh, so, fabric first. So, I think, you know, as, a, as an approach to facade design, I think one of the things, you know, as, as, a, as a practice we passionately believe in is that the diagram on the left of floor to floor, uh, glass uh, all the way round. It's something that, you know, we did for decades and we relied on air conditioning to cool it. But actually, you know, we need to think about how we can design buildings more environmentally responsive. And, you know, this is, this is set out, you know, the BCO spec Guide to Specification talks about this in here. Um, it's not a new thing. In fact, people did it for centuries. But actually, even just thinking about putting an upstand into the building, you know, immediately brings benefits to us. The fact that the upstand reduces um, solar gain, but actually people will quite often say, but actually, what about the daylight factor impact? And the interesting fact is that that sort of bottom piece, pretty much the light gets absorbed straight into the carpet. So actually, the benefit is pretty limited. I think equally, there's also other benefits to having solidity into it as well. The fact with the full height glazing, you can see people's gym kit, the umbrellas, whatever, up against the window. And actually, you know, if we think about putting solidity back into it, actually, we can be environmentally responsive and also deliver something that works better. So as we looked at A3, uh, working with, uh, with, with, with Simon and his team, we undertook a number of studies looking at each facade of the building, trying to sort of study uh, impacts of solar gain onto it, starting to test it, looking at how we could start putting just horizontal bands of solidity into it to see what the impact was, starting to look at actually putting horizontal and vertical bands in it. And this sort of strategy evolved, and it was all about trying to understand for each elevation how much solid to glass ratio should we be looking at trying to obviously balance daylight factor inside, also offsetting that against what the, um, what the sort of reductions we could get in terms of, of, of solar gain. And where we were getting to, you know, in some ways, you know, would, would seem obvious in the fact that we have more solidity onto those southern elevations. As the elevation moves, we can start opening up those windows. As we get towards the north, we can actually become much, much larger on those openings. And that strategy is something we sort of work with and we evolved. And, in terms of U-values, we're looking at 0.15 in terms of the, the areas of solidity, which is pretty onerous. Equally, in terms of air infiltration rates, you know, we're targeting around between 1 and 2 on it. 
and trying to equally at the same time deliver this in a way where actually we can still afford to do it meant that we posed many challenges. You know, a lot of systems can't quite achieve this. So actually what we were looking at was trying to keep the construction of it back to a sort of window wall type construction, something where we could robustly deliver uh, on an affordable budget, uh, that type of system. But we then were still striking upon an issue about how could we then layer up that facade, how we could bring some visual interest, but how could we then further elaborate on the story? And that was where the idea of the greening started to come into it. I think, you know, what some of the problems with uh, city centre sites, especially, you know, when you get into sort of commercial districts, is they're notoriously incredibly hard. We had a site on a major gateway coming in to the city, and how could we do something different? And that was where we quite liked this idea of layering over which led us to this, this sort of image of what we have at the moment of these green walls wrapping over and these sort of ar articulating window scales opening up. The image on here is looking towards the sort of northern corner of the building, which is where we're able to get more glazing into it. But I think the living walls was one of these things that as we worked further and further with it, there became more and more benefits to it. You know, whether it be about sort of removing uh, air pollutants and carbon out of the atmosphere on what is a very sort of busy junction of the, uh, of the city ring road opportunities for urban temperatures to be reduced. So not having all glass, all metal, and basically the heat just radiating off of it, that it actually can absorb it, um, which also brings additional thermal benefits to the building. But also the fact that you know we can add diversity, biodiversity into it. The fact that with the quantity we've got, the biodiversity net gain for the building becomes uh, it, uh, absolutely ginormous, as well as other benefits of you know, rainwater attenuation, general absorption of, of noise around, and and equally bring in a sense of well-being. The fact that even the fact that when you're sat within the office space is looking out, you get elements of that greenery scene, almost like ginormous window boxes as you're looking out and through. And we've been developing this, working with uh, a specialist called ANS. Uh, they are probably the world leaders at delivering these types of systems. They've, they've done them in all different types of locations all around the world. And we're sort of exploring and working with them to understand exactly how we can plant and, and bring through uh, the different types of species that we can get on here, trying to look at actually rather than just having it, it's not just one coloured green wall, but actually trying to explore different uh, opportunities, different planting that come on it here. Ideas that actually what's planted at low level on the south elevation is likely to be different at high level on the north elevation. And actually every plant is being considered due to uh, how it will respond to its environment. In terms of working with them, you know, we've worked with them in the past uh, on a scheme uh, in central London at London Wall where we run through a series of, of, of these green living walls that sort of intertwine with the historic London Wall. But equally, some of you have probably seen it already, and, and I, you know, as many will remember when Deansgate Station first went in. And there was lots of, it will never work, it will never last, it will never happen. And actually, it's been a huge success. And actually, you look out there now, you know, six, seven years on, and actually it's still thriving. And, you know, what we're looking to do is, is, is build on the ideas and the principles of that system and, and build it further. I think what becomes great is that the um, Greater Manchester Council with Salford University have actually been working on a research programme of this. And what we're doing resonates exactly with this, this idea about how we can actually green our cities. And they've been exploring how, with the use of edibles, pollinators, seasonal planting, we can actually get the biodiversity to change but one of the things we're equally fascinated in is, is about how the seasonal planting equally works and comes through on it. The fact that actually the building will slightly change across the seasons and how we'll see different colour change come across it, which adds another layer of interest into it, which gets us to uh, the sort of bigger vision. And then just finally, just to say, one of the other things that's important is, 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 is we're talking just about the building here, but actually trying to understand also how that building sits within its, its context and Irwell Street, which at the moment is a bit of a busy artery that runs into the street. It disconnects A3 building with New Bailey on the opposite side. And working with the landscape architects reform, you know, we've been looking at lots of ways about how we can enhance, improve, treat the edges of this, start actually giving uh, products back to pedestrians, dedicated cycle routes in here that bring sort of connectivity and start to calm uh, the traffic within this. Equally, we've been looking at integrating into this elements of um, swales and, and various other sort of rainwater collection systems as we look to try and sort of green the edges and sort of connect across and see the road actually almost sort of be scaled down and give more back to people. Over to Simon. Great, thank you. 
Uh, as indicated, the starting point was obviously the fabric and getting that right uh, and, and reducing the glazing areas. But one of the things which we didn't touch on was often people cite U values requirements, so 0.1 or 0.15 for the walls and then 1.4 to 1.2 for glazing. Quite often where we're looking at curtain walling, those numbers kind of get muddled together. So what we actually did on A3 was we set an overall combined U-value requirement of 0.65, which is very onerous, for, especially for curtain walling systems. We couldn't actually get curtain walling down that low, and that drove us uh, a lot towards the green facade solution. Uh, so we were able to achieve the U-value requirements because if you just if you increase the glazing areas and achieve just the glazing U-values, the, the heat loss is significantly worse. So we really focused on that fabric first approach, as Stuart indicated, looking at air, pressure, air permeability of two to one, uh, which is almost in line with passive house. Uh, it's not as important as a, as a dwelling because we're not really a heat led building, but we still want to be as low as uh, we can possibly do. One of the most interesting things we looked at was whether we could mix mode the building. So a lot of net, net zero carbon buildings we're looking at, at the moment uh, we're looking at whether we can use natural ventilation. So the ideal thing is to remove cooling altogether. Obviously, in lots of urban environments, that's not possible, especially with heat waves at the moment, temperatures getting up to late 30s, even potentially up to 40 degrees in some urban environments. So what is we consider the kind of the optimum solution is a mixed mode ventilation solution. So that is where you seal the building in winter, you, you make advantage of the heat recovery, uh, and therefore run it when it's extremely low temperatures uh, at its optimum. But as soon as it gets kind of mild outside, kind of into the mid-teens, then you open the windows up, naturally ventilate the space. You can turn the ventilation systems off, you can turn the heating and cooling off, and you can run in that mode for kind of 50, 60, 70% of the year, depending on your facade arrangement. And then only when it gets to kind of those peak few weeks in the summer, when it gets really hot, you seal the building up again and run your air conditioning systems. That's kind of the optimum, but the problem with most buildings is the depth of the building. Luckily, plot A3 was actually quite a nice depth and it was a quite a nice floor plate and we had the potential to move towards a mixed mode solution. Unfortunately, when we looked at the acoustic issues, uh, we couldn't resolve all of them. Uh, we looked at the calming, as indicated, using planting and the landscaping to try and reduce the car speeds. We looked at uh, electrification, so not taking the noise now, but taking the noise of the cars in the future. But even with electric vehicles moving at 30, 40 degrees, the noise was generally considered too high on, on, the, on the proximity to the road. So we're still uh, looking at openable windows, but we're not relying on them for the ventilation solution. But lots of buildings where noise isn't so big an issue, if you can get the depth right, it, it is a significant uh, advantage towards moving to your energy intensity targets. One of the biggest things we looked at on A3 was also looking at reducing internal loads. Uh, so one of the biggest problems we generally see in a lot of buildings is their size for the worst case scenario. So they're sized for one per six, uh, equipment up at 20, 27 watts per square meter, lighting at 10 watts per square meter for that worst case scenario. That means all the equipment is sized at this level, uh, but is operating most of the time at kind of 10 to 20%. And that generally isn't a very efficient range. So what we're trying to do is size the equipment more uh, optimal uh, and run it more efficiently for the, eight, the, the hours that it's running for. Uh, that basically means for chillers, boilers, uh, fan core units, all the equipment that we're basically putting into the building, we're looking at getting it optimized size, not just looking at the peak operation, and then looking at the pieces of equipment to understand how they operate at low loads and low efficiencies. And that's moved, meant that we've moved slightly away from the BCO guide uh, in terms of uh, lighting and um, occupancy and small power uh, cooling requirements. What we've done with the building is designed for adaptability rather than flexibility. Most buildings are designed so that any tenant can move in and easily uh, uh, do their cat be fit out. What we've done at A3 is design it to meet 80 to 90% of occupiers' requirements and where you do have hyper tenants, there is spare capacity in the core and in the riser to connect into those things. That means that we can run those systems efficiently for the majority of the year. We've obviously removed fossil fuel use. So like most new buildings at the moment, we've gone over to heat pumps, air source heat pumps on the roof, which means moving everything uh, up onto the roof, uh, away from the basements. Um, but the main thing that we've been thinking about is how it's gonna be verified in use. So looking at the controls, commissioning strategies, and ultimately neighbors and net zero carbon is about 
performance in use, it's in operation. It doesn't matter what the design calculation says, it's going to be measured and reported and that's where we're going to be judged. So we're going to be fine-tuning the building and going through uh, looking at the performance in use as we go through. And the standard we're going to use to do that is Neighbours UK, which as I said was launched in October earlier in the year, which looks at the landlord systems, so the HEVAC lighting, common area lighting and power and hot water. It doesn't look at things like the small power and tenant uh, lighting. Uh, the building's been designed hopefully to kind of a five and a half star uh, level uh, and that's what's gone into the contract with the contractor and we're aspiring still towards six stars going forward. What's really important is that we design with this in mind and we use the design for performance standard. When we're talking about operation energy, if you're doing complex buildings with HVAC systems, design for performance is probably the most appropriate. It's being pushed by the BCO and supported heavily. Uh, where you're doing probably less complicated buildings, which are more heat-led, Passive House or Sydney TM65 are probably the more appropriate routes to use uh, for design. What it's not, it's, it's not using building regulations or EPC calculations because they're looking at energy efficiency, they're not looking at energy consumption. So they're saying how efficient is the light bulb, not how many light bulbs have I got in the building and how many hours they're run for. But there's a big difference and they generally give uh, considerably uh, more optimistic results in terms of performance. So the design for performance process is really going through the design, the controls, the commissioning, but that verification is really important. We've designed, we're signing up to a commitment against the design performance, but that requires us to uh, verify the performance in use. And again, uh, it's, it's lined up with this uh, UK GPC level and neighbours rating of uh, five and a half star. So the current performance at the end of stage three, uh, you can see here in grey, the re benchmarks. Uh, the green is the ultimate uh, Paris aligned 2050 UK GBC six star level. Uh, A3 is currently slightly above that. We've had a few scenarios where we've been kind of down to that level, but we've, we've tried to keep a level of contingency in the design just so that we're any uh, unknowns or uncertainties don't come back to uh, affect us as we verify in use. And the way we've kind of gone through the process to get down to uh, where we are at the moment was looking at reducing those internal gains, as I said, openable windows, uh, using variable speed control on the ventilation with CO2 sensors, relaxing the set point temperatures uh, so people will have slightly hotter uh, conditions in the summer and slightly cooler in winter, which means there's less hunting of systems and energy wastage, uh, looking at the facade performance, moving over to heat pumps, um, and that's kind of, kind of got us to where we are. If we look at that breaking down by systems, you can see there isn't an easy win apart from the tenant small power, which isn't included in the landlord Lord rating, but you can see there's an even mix of energy, and we've had to reduce all of those. When you break that down in terms of neighbours, uh, you're basically looking at the landlord and tenant and systems. So the UK GBC break it down into 35 and 35, uh, at the moment, A3 is hitting that landlord rating, but even with our most optimistic views of how the tenants will operate the building, because it's speculative, we're still kind of up at kind of 60, 66, 67. Uh, if we get a tenant on board who is willing to uh, engage and, uh, with the net zero carbon program, then we can obviously move that down to 35 or, or close to it. But it's an extremely challenging target for tenants uh, going forward, and there needs to be a significant engagement piece. So you can see here, if we look at the step trajectory, the base building, when it gets opened, will be net zero carbon in accordance with the UK GBC standard, and it will continue being so uh, up until kind of 2035, where we might need to do minor uh, modifications to the design in order to get it to comply with the Paris proof ag agreements. The challenge will ultimately be with the tenant energy consumption, where, as I said, most tenants' energy consumption is well above that uh, 35, normally at least double that, working with some clients who actually triple or quadruple that number. So that's going to be a significant challenge. And where landlords have committed to be net zero carbon across all three of their scopes, they've included a commitment for their occupiers. So people like Aviva, Legal and General, who have all signed up to be net zero carbon, that includes their occupier emissions. And they really need to think about how they're going to engage with those occupiers to drive down those emissions. And it needs significant changes in the way we operate buildings to get down to that kind of final level with the occupiers. We'll design the building to help them do it, but it needs to be a journey we go on with them. So just to summarise, uh, these are kind of the kind of some of the key measures we've integrated to get down to where we are. We're still looking at introducing a few more, but the 
kind of the big ones were, the, as I said, the fabric burst, removing fossil fuel combustion on site, and then looking at optimizing the performance of all the systems, making sure they're sized correctly, and then operating at their, their, their maximum for the majority of the year. So that was kind of a high level overview of net zero carbon in operation and A3. Does anyone have any questions? Question at the back. It's going to be a significant challenge, but you have to remember there's pressures coming uh, from both sides of the market at the moment. So the biggest uh, driver we're seeing for net zero carbon is coming from finance, actually. Most financial firms are setting rigid ESG strategies and requirements. But at the same time, a lot of occupiers are setting their own net zero carbon strategies. Uh, a lot of people are doing signing up to something called a science-based target. A science-based target is very similar to... Um, what we, we, what we were talking about there, intensity targets, you have to do absolute reductions. You can't use offsetting for um, science-based targets. And we're working with a lot of occupiers and organizations who have set these targets to reduce their own emissions, uh, and they need their real estate to form part of that. So they're looking at it anyway, and they're, if they're coming to the party saying, we need the building to get us to net zero carbon, then that's the first step. But even just having minor engagement sessions, so we're working with quite a lot of landlords at the moment, both the commercial offices and uh, light industrial and many things. Just having workshops and engagement and showing an interest uh, starts the, the process off. And you can get quick wins fairly easily on the occupy side, but most buildings you can go in and reduce energy consumption by 20, 30% just by playing with the controls and how it's operated and how the, the tenants use the space. But it's keeping maintaining that, that level is always the difficult things. You make improvements, but it unfortunately creeps back up. So it's having a consistent approach to maintaining that.